and welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Perrin. I'm uh, privileged to be the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, and a professor of sociology here as well. And I'm thrilled today to introduce the 2021 Mary Stevens Reckford Distinguished Lecture. Uh, the Reckford Lecture honors the birthday of Mary Stevens Reckford, a beloved classicist uh, and member of the UNC Chapel Hill community uh, with an annual lecture in European studies. Um, we're happy today to have the partnership uh, with the Center for European Studies also here at UNC Chapel Hill and thank them for their, um, for their assistance and participation. Uh, and also happy to welcome members of the Reckford family uh, who have uh, so generous, generously supported this lecture. Um, the Institute for the Arts and Humanities here at UNC um, is, as we like to say fondly, the best place on campus. Uh, we seek to keep the conversations going, the intellectual life flowing, and to support, promote, and deploy artistic and humanistic scholarship and creativity uh, at UNC as well as beyond. Uh, and to that end, we're thrilled to, to host the conversation today uh, with uh, Catherine Woolard. Um, so let me give you a, a brief, a little brief um, uh, housekeeping, and then uh, we'll uh, move to the introduction. Um, we do ask if you can, if you're able to leave your video on, but your microphone off during the talk so that we can better simulate the kinds of conversations we all wish we could be having uh, in, in beautiful Hyde Hall. Um, when we get to the question and answer and conversation section of the event, um, you can post uh, questions in the chat or raise your hand using the raise hand feature and uh, we'll open it up at that point for conversations, questions, comments, etc. Um, I am thrilled today to be able to introduce our 2021 Mary Stevens Reckford speaker, uh, Catherine Woolard. She's the, the uh, Director or Secretary General of the European Council on Refugees and Exiles and has been there since 2016. She's worked in the NGO sector since 2003 and is focused on human rights, conflict prevention, security and governance reform, and has worked in a number of other areas uh, as well. Uh, the European Council on Refugees and Exiles, shortened to ECRE, is a pan-European alliance of 107 NGOs in 40 countries, protecting and advancing the rights of refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced persons. And their mission is to promote the establishment of fair and humane European asylum policies and practices in accordance with international human rights law. We thought in particular in this year, when uh, questions about international migration and refugees are so uh, top of mind, not just in Europe, um, but worldwide. This would be a particularly good time to feature a conversation that crosses the pond uh, and, and brings a global perspective to questions about uh, fairness, human rights, uh, and exiles and refugees uh, as well. Um, we will be recording the lecture and we'll post it uh, after light editing to our website. Um, so let me just at this point say uh, thank you again for your uh, for joining us today uh, and we're looking forward to the conversation and I'll move it, I'll pass it over to uh, Catherine Woolard, welcome. Uh, thank you so much and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure to have been invited to give this lecture. I only wish I could be with you there in person, uh, but uh, unfortunately not this year. So the lecture is entitled Protection versus Externalization. The Politics and the Law of Asylum in Europe, 2015 to 2020. Um, I will examine the political crisis on refugee issues that took place in 2015 and 2016, and then Europe's response since then, um, taking us up to the contemporary uh, situation. And I will be Ill, probably ill-advisedly slipping in and out, out of slides. Of slides. Um, um, here you can see the structure of the lecture. So I'll talk first about the crisis that happened in 2015 and 2016. 
And then about Europe's response. And this is the strategy that we term externalization. And I'll say a bit more about the measures that are part of that strategy. And then I'll conclude with a few comments on the impact of what's been happening in Europe, the impact on the relationship between law and politics, between the EU and European nations, and the impact on the relationship between Europe and the rest of the world. Um, I'm particularly interested also in hearing your views on the parallels, uh, the similarities, the differences compared to what's happening in the US and, and uh, the, the rest of the Americas region. Um, I, at the end, I make a, a, a couple of hypotheses, let us say. So I'd also be interested in hearing um, your views on whether they, you think they're accurate. Um, so if I just come out of um, the sharing, um, before I start, let me mention a few qualifications. Um, firstly, I myself do not have a refugee background, um, which is lucky for me because it's not a status that many people want to have, although at the same time it's a status that is sought um, and needed by many. Um, we include people with a refugee background in all areas of our work at ACRE as staff members, members of the Alliance, board members, experts, um, and so on. But I'm not speaking from direct experience myself. Um, and with this lecture, we look at politics and law in this area. So stepping back a little from direct experience. And um, secondly, all of that said, uh, ECRE as an alliance is not neutral on this topic. Um, as our chair mentioned, we're an alliance of not-for-profit organizations um, across Europe. And we have a clear mission, which is to defend the human rights of refugees and other displaced people in Europe and in Europe's foreign policy. Um, our work covers litigation, advocacy and communications. Um, but there's a conflict on this issue in Europe and we're not impartial in that conflict. We're very clearly on one side um, of uh, what is at sometimes a very deep um, and at times even violent conflict um, concerning uh, migration and refugee rights. And um, finally, just as a note on terminology, I'll often use the shorthand refugees or refugees and migrants. This is, of course, a simplification. And one of the key issues in this debate is about legal status. Um, but just in the interests of brevity, I'll tend to say refugees. Um, and a lot of my comments refer to the European Union the EU, uh, but we also work on and look at Europe more widely. So the EU, the 27 member states of the EU, and the binding legal framework on asylum that should apply, that does apply, but is not always implemented in those countries. Um, but wider Europe is part of this picture as well. So let me move to the first part of the discussion, the crisis. So in 2015, 2016, there was a deep political crisis in Europe on refugee and migration if issues. This was and is still often called the refugee crisis. Um, we prefer to avoid this term and talk instead about the political crisis or the European political crisis on refugee issues. To say the refugee crisis makes it sound like it was the responsibility of refugees, when this was in fact a crisis of European politics, and indeed even of European identity. There's no doubt though that it was a crisis, uh, even though it shouldn't have been. The arrival of refugees in Europe triggered a, a paralyzing, divisive, and at times chaotic political crisis that lasted for more than a year. It was something that was time consuming and disruptive and very much dominated politics, particularly the politics of the European Union. Um, it was also an unnecessary crisis. Yes, there was an increase in the number of refugees arriving in Europe, but Europe could and should have managed that situation. As one of the richest regions of the world uh, with operational resources, 
it could have managed. And not only that, Europe could even have benefited because it needs new populations. Uh, some would argue that the real crisis in Europe is the demographic crisis with depopulation in many regions, lowest birth rates in the world, and to an extent that this threatens the prosperity and even the existence of some European countries. Nonetheless, an extraordinary and unnecessary political crisis broke out. And why was that? Um, before we look at the response, um, let's have a look at some of the reasons why this manageable situation became a crisis. So first of all, the numbers do matter. Um, and I'll share the next slide here. If we move. So the slide that you can see there shows the number of people seeking asylum in Europe, starting from 2008 and coming up to the end of 2019. And what you can see from 2015 to 2006, uh, uh, 2014 to 2015, excuse me, is this great increase in the numbers of arrivals. And in fact, there was a quadrupling of the number of people seeking protection in Europe. In 2014, 250,000 people. And then in 2015, over a million people uh, came and sought asylum in Europe. And this is the large increase that you see on the slide there. Nonetheless, a million people could have been a, a manageable situation in a, con a continent of 750 million people. That would have constituted 0.0013% of Europe's population. So a small addition. Um, why did it cause such uh, difficulty? Another reason was the, uh, the people themselves, who they were. And if we move to the next slide here, here you can see a pie chart which shows the countries of origin of those arriving. So the majority were from Syria. This is the big block that you can see there. Um, and in fact, it's probably more than this 50% because under the other, uh, there are people whose nationality wasn't known. There are also stateless Palestinians who were previously refugees in Syria, for instance. So um, a larger number than even the 50% was probably uh, from Syria. Then we have Afghanistan and Iraq as the two other sizable uh, countries of origin where there were sizable numbers of refugees that arrived that year. Um, and then the fourth country here, ERI, is Eritrea. Um, and then after that, there are a smaller numbers, less significant of people from other countries, Pakistan, Nigeria, Iran, Somalia. Um, so the big three and then Eritrea following afterwards. Now, if we reflect a moment on why those countries of origin was, why this was a factor in what happened or why a crisis developed, let's say. Um, based on those countries, it's clear that the large majority of those arriving were refugees. Um, and in fact, there's a sort of irony in this debate, which is it probably would have been easier for Europe to manage had they not been refugees, because people coming who at, certainly at the time um, had to be treated as refugees. There are obligations under national EU and international law to offer protection to these people. Um, the average length of displacement globally is up to 18 years. So it's clear that these people arriving would also be in Europe for a long time. Um, unfortunately, there's other uh, uh, problematic reasons why uh, hostility and panic arose. The majority of those arriving were Muslims and they were non-white. And this did provoke or exacerbate racist and Islamophobic responses in Europe. Another reason for the panic was the manner of arrivals. So in that period, 95%, over 95% of the refugees arriving arrived by sea. And the arrival of people seeking protection by sea is something that always creates fear 
um, historically and in all regions. It's almost something primordial. It stimulates historical memories of invasion, for instance, even though the people themselves may not be a threat. So that manner of arrival was also a factor. Nonetheless, the reasons for the crisis were just as much about Europe as about the people coming. Um, Europe could have managed if it responded collectively, but it didn't. Um, one million people distributed equally and evenly across Europe was more than manageable, as we saw, given the size and the richness of the continent. Um, Instead, European countries entered what some call the race to the bottom, a competition to treat people as badly as possible so that they didn't stay in their country, but instead were pushed or moved on somewhere else. So there was not a, the collective response that was needed. Um, and a final reason I'll mention was um, the legal situation that people faced when they arrived and some of the dysfunctionalities in the European asylum framework. So asylum is a competence of the European Union, meaning that the countries, the member states have transferred competence, sovereignty in asylum policy to the EU. It's part of the EU's legal order. And, and this is binding law, um, much stronger in effect than international law more generally, um, binding on the 27 member states and associated countries, most of Europe. It's the most developed legal regime for refugees in the world. Um, with legal standards on the reception of people seeking asylum, the procedures that have to be applied, um, the, the determination of refugee status, and also on rules for sharing responsibility across Europe. Um, unfortunately, there are flaws that continue to this day. One is a lack of implementation and compliance with these laws. And that remains the case. And um, this is a usual complaint of NGOs in any field that laws need to be implemented and they're not. Um, I think this is particularly extreme area of law where impunity for member states that violate EU asylum law is accepted and happens uh, flagrantly. Um, so these laws are supposed to harmonise the situation across Europe, but they weren't being properly implemented. So that also meant that protection standards were very different from one country to another, as well as many other factors that uh, create difference between the European countries. Um, there's also a very dysfunctional law as part of this EU asylum framework, um, and that is the Dublin Regulation. Um, within Europe, I think we could call that the infamous Dublin regulation. Um, and this is the rule that says which country is responsible for an individual refugee's case for examining the asylum application. And if I may oversimplify, the rule says that the first country the person enters is responsible for them. So, for instance, um, if a Chechen refugee crosses from the Russian Federation, a non-EU country, of course, into Poland, the first EU country that person enters, according to the rules, Poland is responsible for the asylum application and then the, the protection of that person. Um, so if a Ukrainian flees the conflict in Ukraine and crosses into Romania, an EU country, Romania is responsible. Even if that person goes somewhere else, legally, Romania is the first country they entered is responsible. So if 800,000 Syrian refugees cross from Turkey into Greece, who is responsible for 800,000 Syrian refugees? According to the rules, Greece. Um, and so there we see the dysfunctionality of those rules, which had long been considered unfair, particularly by the countries at the borders. Um, and the countries at the borders objecting to these rules basically follow different strategies. They have a perverse incentive to keep conditions as bad as possible 
so that people entering don't stay in the, their, those countries. And that also, if somebody, a refugee, then moves to another European country, if the country uh, of uh, at the border, Greece, Italy, wherever, if the conditions are so bad, it becomes illegal for those people to be sent back. So they actually have a perverse incentive in keeping conditions so bad that courts refuse to implement the Dublin regulation and send them back. Um, this was a situation already existing, well known, um, but that of course created problems in 2015. Um, and one of the effects of this was that all of these nearly a million people arriving in Greece didn't stay very long nor did Greece want them to stay, nor were the conditions in Greece adequate for the people. So we saw the movement of people across Europe on foot in quite dramatic scenes to reach parts of Central Europe. Um, and those of you uh, are connected to the internet, take, I invite you to take a look at the map, look at the journey that people were making from Turkey uh, next to Syria there, non-EU country, trying to get into the EU, into Greece, and then from Greece all the way across the Balkans. Um, and so this added to the crisis and created humanitarian emergency. So let's, that's the situation. Let's look now at the response of Europe, um, which continues to this day. And I'm going to share a slide here on um, the faces of Europe's response. Now, um, here you can see two faces of Europe's response to the arrival of refugees. On the left are people who are welcoming and supporting refugees. And there was and there still is immense support for people arriving in Europe. Here we see demonstrations from organizations, including Refugees Welcome, Migrants Organize, and many millions of Europeans acted and continue to act as volunteers, supporting people arriving. Um, we see ordinary citizens, we see professionals, lawyers, doctors, faith communities, um, rescue workers, people stepping in to support people arriving. Many of our member organizations received huge uh, increase in donations to support their work um, during this crisis. Many families, including here in Brussels, where I am now, right now, people host refugees and migrants in their own houses. And there's also strong support from many local governments, from many city administrations, and also from the business sector. Um, and what we saw is that people stepped in when states and governments either refused or became overwhelmed. And I'll give you the most extreme example. At one point, there were 12 not-for-profit organizations which operated search and rescue missions in the Mediterranean Sea. So when states closed down search and rescue, uh, NGOs bought boats uh, and started operating search and rescue. Even um, the Protestant church in Germany, for instance, has bought a boat, which it now operates, a ship, I should say, sorry, any um, sailors listening will be shocked at that, um, a, a ship that is used to rescue people in the Mediterranean. So you have that, what was described by one of our members as a wave of generosity from Europeans. On the other hand, there was also strong opposition. And in the image on the right there, you can see Matteo Salvini, who's an Italian pop politician, the leader of a far right, anti-migration, openly racist political party, um, known as one of the new populist, uh, it's not a new party, but it's a newly populist party, let us say. Um, and his party, Lega Nord, was in Italy's government from 2017 to 2019, um, where he was the interior minister um, and introduced a very problematic laws, but also, for instance, refused to allow rescue ships to disembark um, in Italy. Um, an interesting point to note here is that although that party and Salvini himself are anti-migration, anti-refugee, um, the poster that you see in the background uh, says uh, schiavi dell'Europa, which means um, the slaves of Europe 
no thank you. And um, this is actually criticism, not of people arriving, but of the rest of Europe for not giving enough solidarity to Italy as a country at the border, which is responsible for everybody that arrives there. So the Dublin regulation that we discussed, I mentioned earlier, is one of the reasons that Salvini was elected, because in Italy, people feel that the rules are unfair. Um, nonetheless, it is also um, a, a openly hostile and racist political party and that group of leaders uh, in that way. So um, let me just stop sharing for a minute. So what we see in Europe and its response is that there is polarization. Um, you have the, the welcoming Europe, you have the hostile Europe, and then of course you have lots of people in the middle. Um, what happened in 2016 after the period of crisis and panic, a strategy emerged supported by Europe's leadership. And in our view, that strategy is more on the hostile side than the welcoming side. Although um, many mainstream political leaders would dispute that. And um, the common name for this approach is externalization. Um, it was not a, not a snappy name, but um, that's the term we use. And that is based on preventing the arrival in Europe of people seeking protection, keeping people out or getting people out through deportation. The objective being to externalize responsibilities for protection to countries outside Europe, and even to externalize, to take out the people themselves. Um, and I'll just share the, the slide um, summarizing the externalization approach. So externalization operates at three levels. There are measures that come under external policy, that come under border policies, and that come under internal policies. So it's not just about external policy. The whole strategy is about stopping people arriving to seek protection or um, getting people out, um, minimizing Europe's responsibilities, but there's different measures at different levels. Um, and I'll just uh, give a few examples of how that's been put in place and continues to be used. So when it comes to external policies, agreements with other countries um, that Europe uses to stop people leaving those countries or to get those countries to host people. And the epitome of this is the EU-Turkey deal. And so the EU-Turkey deal of 2016 was how Europe left the crisis that I've just described. Um, the deal basic was based on Turkey agreeing to stop people leaving from Turkey. And in exchange, the EU offered certain benefits to Turkey for doing this. Um, and we're talking primarily about refugees. Um, there are four, now 4 million Syrian refugees in Turkey. It's the largest refugee hosting country in the world. Um, and in the, the deal that Europe did with Turkey, from one day to the next, it basically stopped people from taking this journey from Turkey to Greece and then up the rest of Europe. Um, there's a discussion often about the money that was offered to Turkey for doing this, 6 billion euro. Um, but I would argue very strongly that it was not about the money um, because 6 billion euro for a country like Turkey is really not a significant sum. There were many other benefits that Turkey received. Um, so moving on, those kind of external policies and deals after um, the deal with Turkey, there's been attempts to replicate that policy with other countries. Um, so that continues. We also then see strategies and measures at borders. And at borders, there are attempts to prevent the entry of people. Fences and walls were built at land borders. In 2000, February 2016, before the deal with Turkey, borders crossed, uh, came down across the Western Balkans, again from one day to the next, so that those people trying to move to the center of Europe could no longer do so. 
those measures continue, one of the major issues that we work on is violent pushbacks of refugees trying to enter Europe. And at many of Europe's borders, there's a situation of trying to prevent entry. This also happens at the maritime borders. Um, in at maritime borders, it's more about omission rather than action. So the state and the European Union have significantly reduced search and rescue efforts. Um, and that means fewer people are able to reach Europe through sea routes. It also means that the Mediterranean Sea is the deadliest sea in the world, um, with between 3,000 and 5,000 people dying in the sea every year when they attempt to cross. Um, there's also uh, attempts to block NGO search and rescue vessels from disembarking. Um, there's also cooperation with coast guards from other countries um, so that they pull people back to their countries. So, Europe supports the Turkish Coast Guard as part of the deal with Turkey. And if Turkish Coast Guard rescues people, they're taken to Turkey. More controversially, there are deals and support for the Coast Guard of Libya. And that means when people try to leave from Libya, they're picked up by the Libyan Coast Guard and taken back to Libya. Um, we'll say a little about that afterwards. Um, there's also the element of containing people at borders in detention centers. So the EU Turkey deal also involves the containment of people who manage to cross from Turkey into Greece. They're then detained on the Greek islands um, and uh, tens of thousands of people have been contained in this situation in Greece in appalling humanitarian conditions um, since 2016. Uh, others arriving since then, not allowed to move on from the Greek islands. And um, in a situation that I, I would say is probably worse than anything that's been happening in the US, although, of course, um, you know, in recent years, uh, there's, there's also been scandals there. But when we're asked about the situation in the US, we also refer to the fact that at Europe's borders, um, there are also abuses taking place. Finally, externalization also includes internal policies. And these are policies that attempt to make it more difficult for people to receive international protection. So they um, change the rules. Uh, they also change asylum law and uh, migration law to create harsher conditions from asyl for asylum seekers and refugees. And this is often a deliberate strategy of deterrence. Um, in the UK, this is actually called the hostile environment policy. Um, and the reforms, proposed reforms of European asylum law in 2016 attempted to codify some of these measures that made it more difficult to get protection. Um, and I'll just wrap up this point by taking us to the present day where I'm sharing a slide now um, that shows, illustrates some of this approach. Um, this is a picture from last year, February 2020. Um, the situation was that after various standoffs and conflicts with Turkish President Erdogan, Turkey decided to renege on aspects of the deal and was letting people cross into Greece. And this created a panic, a small panic and a small crisis in Europe, um, a disproportionate crisis nonetheless. And people tried, were crossing from Turkey into Greece. Here we see all the leaders of Europe going down to Greece um, to show support for Greece's defense of Europe against the refugees and migrants that were coming. If you see this image, we have Ursula von der Leyen at the front, the president of the European Commission. Behind her is Charles Michel, who is the president of the European Council. We then have the Greek prime minister and the president of the European Parliament. So it's really the top leadership of Europe. And the image is deliberately military. They've come out of a military helicopter. They're with the military. Um, and von der Leyen described Greece as Europe's shield. 
Um, so again, we see this language of security used about people arriving. Um, there is also actually a video of this trip um, showing the leaders going down to defend Europe against the, the refugees. Um, and it has a soundtrack, which is uh, music that sounds like an action film. So we see really this um, highly militarized uh, attitude. Um, and let me come out of the slides there. Um, last year, we also see, saw the publication of the European Pact on Migration and Asylum, which continues with proposals based on this externalization model. Um, so let me conclude now with just a few remarks on the impact of all of this, um, and then we can open for questions. So has this approach, so-called externalization, been successful? Well, let us look at, again at the slide that we looked at right at the beginning. Um, uh, those are some of ECRE's alternatives. The numbers, as you remember, we saw this big rise in people arriving to seek protection. And then 2016, we have the EU-Turkey deal and another secret deal to close the Balkan route and numbers fall and fall. Um, they now fall even more because of COVID, but that, that is a, a, a different, uh, different issue. Um, and then I'll just read you this quote from uh, Commissioner Avramopoulos, who was the Commissioner for Migration of the EU. Um, the results of our common European approach speak for themselves. Irregular arrivals are now lower than before the crisis. Um, EU border protection has been taken to a new level. So most politicians, many politicians at least, see the EU-Turkey deal as a success and have attempted to replicate it elsewhere. The measurement of success has become are irregular arrivals of people uh, being limited or being stopped. At the same time, there are of course terrible humanitarian costs. We saw right at the beginning of the discussion that the vast majority of those arriving during the so-called crisis were refugees. So the impact of this is that refugees are prevented from moving forward uh, to seek protection and arriving at protection. Um, they're stuck and contained in places which are not safe. Um, they're contained on the Greek islands in appalling situations. They're contained in Turkey which has 4 million Syrian refugees and around uh, 600,000 people of other nationalities, more than anywhere else in the world. And even though Turkey is doing a lot, our view, in our view, it is not safe for Syrian refugees or, or others. People are also contained in Libya. Um, as we saw earlier, the coast cooperation with the Libyan Coast Guard means that not only are people stuck there, but if they try to leave to cross the Mediterranean, the Libyan Coast Guard, funded by the EU, will take them back to Libya. Um, we've seen what's happening in Libya. Torture, extreme sexual violence, war, militia activity, and even slavery involving the buying and selling of migrants. So many of these harsh measures that Europe puts in place in its internal policies are supposed to act as a deterrent because there's a strong belief in our political leaders that there's a pull factor, that people are being attracted and pulled to Europe. And um, the evidence shows that there's no, actually no evidence whatsoever that there are, that pull factors even exist. But this idea has a strong grip on the political imagination in Europe. Again, if we look at where people come from, push factors are the more likely reason rather than a pull factor. Um, and so people still try to reach Europe despite the creation of harsh and, and hostile regimes. Um, there's also a strong impact on the relationship between law and politics. We argue that there's a misuse and a distortion of law to serve political objectives. So 
there's um, in this discussion of externalization, there's a hard version that says nobody at all should come, which is the position of a Salvini or, or a Viktor Orban. Um, but there's also a version that says refugees are OK. Europe should offer protection for refugees, but other migrants should be protected, uh, prevented from coming. So irregular migrants should not be allowed to come or nobody should be allowed to arrive in an irregular way. Um, this is very disingenuous because it contradicts international refugee law. Refugees are allowed, they have the right to cross borders in any circumstances to seek protection. And um, so you can't say refugees are OK, but all the borders are closed. How would they arrive? Um, there's also greater political intrusion into legal systems um, in order to try to stop people getting protection status and being classed as refugees. Um, so uh, efforts to use safe third country concepts, for instance, um, efforts that undermine um, the rule of law itself. So I mentioned the pact on migration and asylum from last year, which it contains new legislative proposals. A common theme is the reduction in the right to appeal in asylum law. And that's because in many cases, at first instance, um, a person actually at first instance, about a third of people receive protection. Um, and then many other cases are overturned on appeal, where the courts will say, actually, this person is a refugee, does need protection, um, and then they're granted protection on appeal. Um, so the response to that of uh, European leaders is to limit the right to appeal. Um, and in any area of law, the right to appeal is simply an essential part of a legal process. It's not some special thing that asylum law has or an indulgence offered to asylum seekers. Um, it is a fundamental aspect of the legal process in any area of law. Um, and it's a human right, the right to an effective remedy. Um, we also see attempts to impose solutions and end some of uh, the conflicts on this issue through legal means. And we also see the use of law to stop the actions of those who support refugees and migrants. So, for instance, the criminalization of humanitarian action, which is a major issue for many of our members. Um, my final point on the political, uh, when we're talking about impact, the political impact on Europe. I'm just going to share uh, the screen again to cover that uh, point. So um, I'm not sure how many of you recognize this fine fellow here. Um, this is one of Europe's mini Trumps, as they're sometimes called. Um, he's actually more successful probably than the original Donald Trump um, because he's been in power uh, since 2010 and very much consolidated. This is Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, um, a strong, a so-called strongman leader, nationalistic, xenophobic, populist, illiberal, undermining the rule of law, anti-EU, so against European integration because that is something that undermines European nations in his view. Um, it hit a few quotes from Orban. The best migrant is the migrant who does not come. There is a clear link between illegal migrants coming to Europe and the spread of terrorism, uh, which is uh, not true. Now, currently, three EU member states are led by such uh, leaders. Um, at one point, nine EU countries had parties that represented this kind of view in power, but many have actually lost, uh, lost power. These leaders and this new populism, this extremism, this anti-immigration um, rhetoric uh, 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 parties were able to exploit the crisis of 2015-16. They used it to mobilize their supporters, to attack the European Union, and to attack progressives and liberals. Um, but we would suggest this was a distraction in many ways. Many of these regimes and these governments are deeply corrupt, also undemocratic, 
Um, and so they use the age old strategy of blaming outsiders, finding scapegoats to distract from what's going on. Um, one of the problems in Europe is that mainstream political parties panicked and they started to adopt similar policies to these kind of parties and also the language and rhetoric of these parties. In some cases, they formed governing coalitions with these parties. Um, in our view, this is a self-defeating strategy and many of the mainstream parties lost votes because of this. The European public actually remain supportive of refugee protection and of immigration in general. So there isn't a, a huge market of votes. Um, and our ad advice to other parties has been to focus on other issues instead of absorbing um, the approach of these uh, parties. Um, and with that, I would just um, show you this slide. I'm not sure how many of you recognize this. This is the COVID virus. Um, so one of the arguments we've made, for instance, is to look at what are the actual threats that Europe faces and the threats as perceived by European public um, who don't see refugees or migration as a security threat or indeed as any kind of threat, um, except in countries where leaders are espousing and have been for a long time espousing this kind of rhetoric like Hungary. Um, and look instead at climate change, um, terrorism, uh, health emergencies, um, the real fears that Europeans have. Um, and then the final point, um, just to wrap up, is the impact of all of this on the rest of the world. So here we have a few statistics about displacement globally. More people are displaced, forcibly displaced than ever before, nearly 80 million people. And um, that's doubled in 10 years. 26 million refugees, many are internally displaced. 85% of those people, displaced people, are in developing countries. They're not in Europe and they're not anywhere near Europe. Yet there continues to be this fear that if there's anything other than a harsh treatment, that people will come. Um, they're mainly in the same major refugee hosting countries and the only European countries that have a significant refugee population are Turkey, of course, because the rest of Europe is using Turkey uh, as a containment area and Germany, um, which also has a significant number of refugees and traditionally has had. Um, all the other refugee hosting countries are elsewhere. Uh, Uganda, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, um, uh, Iran, and, and so on. So there has been a damaging uh, effect of Europe's strategy on the rest of the world. Um, it's not so much that Europe is seen as a model. Um, to some extent, yes, in the US, in Australia, where these countries learn from each other about bad practices in terms of deflecting and externalizing responsibility. But the biggest negative impact is the direct effect, doing deals with uh, repressive regimes, disrupting economic migration, even when people are not moving towards Europe, distorting foreign policy and development policy. So the focus is migration control and not the real objectives of these policies. Europe's reputation and influence in Africa in particular has been undermined. Um, reforming international refugee law remains necessary, but is not really possible because European nations would use any opening up of the convention to reduce protection as they've tried to do with legal reform in Europe. Um, I think these trends are likely to continue, but the positive trends also continue. So there'll be continued opposition to the arrival of people from leaders in Europe but there will also be strong support for refugees. And in many ways, this is a perpetual struggle, like many human rights struggles and many struggles and conflicts over identity. Um, and the long-term trend is more positive, despite the negative impact of this recent crisis and the harsh response. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, lots of uh, important information, complicated questions, a really interesting conversation. I'm looking forward immediately uh, to some great conversations. Um, 
uh, we've got a, a question already in the chat, so I'll go ahead and uh, and open it up for that one. This comes from Dave Sidor, who says, besides Germany, please name the EU states willing to accept their share of refugees. Would a fully integrated EU treat the crisis differently? Um, yes, I, I think that's a, a key question. Um, so in 2015, 2016, um, the countries that took the largest share per population of refugees arriving were Germany and Sweden. Um, and in the end, Sweden actually closed it, it, it closed its borders as, as an exaggeration, but tried to stop people arriving because it felt that it, it couldn't take in any more. And in those two countries and other countries where there were a larger proportion of refugees, there's a strong resentment and anger about other countries not taking on their responsibility. Um, and th this is a, a continual theme in Europe that countries blame each other. So the North will blame Italy and Greece for not treating people decently, and then they're, they're moving on towards Northern Europe. Um, but those countries consider that the rules, the Dublin rule, are, is unfair anyway. Um, I think a fully integrated EU could have treated the crisis differently. Um, the key issue is, um, had power to decide on asylum applications being transferred to the EU level, because now you have this hybrid situation that countries are responsible, there's EU law, but nations are responsible for deciding and for putting in place conditions. So if you had a, a more unified system or you have the European Union itself deciding on applications and distributing people in an, on, in an obligatory way, then the fair sharing of responsibility could have happened. Um, as it stands, there's only one country in Europe that we would say is open now, openly positive about refugees and migrants. I'm not sure if anybody knows that country, Portugal. Um, everywhere else, uh, that there's um, hostility. And a, a final point on that, I, I think because the Europeans can't agree among themselves, this is why we see this externalization strategy, because the only thing they agree on is externalizing responsibility to others. Great. Uh, the floor is open. If anyone would like to ask a question or make a comment, please feel free to post in the chat or raise your hand uh, under the, um, the participants section. I'll ask one as, as uh, people are considering, you know, it, it, it struck me toward the beginning of your talk. Um, it wasn't so long ago that one of the big questions for Europe was about the fertility decline and the, um, the crisis of, of European fertility and the, the, the questions of, of straightforward sort of um, ethnic bigotry or racism strike me as really um, central to the kind of, of questions you're addressing, given that, honestly, a flow of migrants into Europe could be understood as a, um, a solution of sorts um, to, uh, to what we were talking about in the, in the fertility crisis. Um, what do you think explains the, um, the sort of unified hostility, I suppose, with the exception of Portugal, um, to migrants and refugees, given that background? Um, yeah, yes, I think this is a crucial question because what we end up with is a strategy that is actually not rational. It's not in Europe's own economic or political interests, which would rather be to find a way to absorb new populations. And um, of course, there's an obligation to give protection to refugees, but in addition, it could be a win-win situation. Um, I, I think that... The, the, there, there are, are multiple reasons for this. Um, the the populist, so-called populist parties, I prefer to call them extremist or far-right parties, um, were able to exploit public fears in some cases. Um, so that generates uh, fear, hostility, racism, prejudice, or taps into latent 
um, hostility and prejudice. Um, and the nature of the crisis also fed that, the images that were coming up and the way that people were arriving. Um, and that's always part of, um, unfortunately, even in the, the most progressive and democratic of countries, there's always a section of the population that will be attracted by that kind of approach. Um, I think the this is exacerbated in Europe by political fragmentation. So in many European political systems, you have a large number of parties all getting small amounts of the vote. Mm -hmm. So if you have an extremist party that is only, most of them only get 10 or 15%, but still that can make, make you a kingmaker in a coalition negotiation and gives a smaller parties um, disproportionate power. So that's also a factor. In fact, most Europeans are not hostile to refugees or even to migrants, mm -hmm. but more generally, um, but a small, um, a, a, you know, small percentage of the vote uh, can have a, 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 a disproportionate effect. Um, I think this is why we feel particularly angry, I think, about the mainstream parties. Extremist parties are always there, even in post-war Europe, in Germany, after the fall of the Nazis, there were extreme right post-Nazi parties. Unfortunately, they're always part of our political landscape. Um, the problem is if mainstream parties start absorbing these views. Um, and I think this is what's happened. Um, there's also different fears in different parts of, the Euro of Europe. And to give you an example, the country, uh, um, the, the, the country that is shrinking fastest in the whole world is Bulgaria. Um, it, the population is shrinking so fast that the, the future of the country in some senses is, is at risk. Low birth rates, immigration to other parts of Europe. Um, but it, it's a, a fervently anti-refugee, anti-migration country. Um, and you think, well, people should welcome new populations. You know, villages, towns are dying out because people leave. Um, but that's part of the problem because then people fear this replacement. Mm -hmm. um, so they may become more hostile. And there's also a deep trauma sometimes because young people have emigrated to other parts of Europe. Um, and so... So, sort of welcoming new populations may become more difficult even. Um, I might jump in to some of the other questions that I've seen in, in the chat there yes. um, on the benefits that Turkey received, which I left hanging. Um, so Turkey, Turkey received a number of, of things. Um, one was additional cooperation on the part of NATO and support from NATO for its operations in Syria um, and its naval operations um, in the Aegean that were related to Syria. Um, and Turkey is a, um, it is a player in the Syrian war. It has many interests there and it's one of the countries that's engaged in proxy wars in Syria. Um, and it was able to go ahead with some of those actions without uh, being criticized and with at least tacit support from its NATO allies and from other European countries. That's one issue. Um, it received concessions in the process towards EU accession um, and also in the customs union. Um, it's, it's part of a customs union with the EU. There's ongoing negotiations and it received concessions there. Um, I think most uh, important to President Erdogan, um, well, I should say it, it also has carte blanche for what it does at its border with Syria. So one of the most negative aspects of the deal is that Turkey prevents people leaving from Turkey and it also prevents people leaving Syria coming into Turkey. And, and this was allowed to continue and take place with no criticism because of this dependence that's created mm. on Turkey. Um, Turkey also received Im, um, a sort of immunity from criticism when it, it's, uh, it, for its domestic political actions. 
So since the EU-Turkey deal, we've seen an attempted coup in Turkey and then um, a series of extremely repressive measures from the Turkish government, all of which has happened with very limited comment uh, from Europe and continued support, uh, trade relations, um, uh, funding going in, uh, so on, cooperation with Turkey, despite highly undemocratic actions taking place there, from the imprisonment of journalists to the fixing, um, gaming the political system. Should Thank I you. dive into the question uh, on Africa that's in the I chat? was just going to suggest, yes, uh, that Kathleen Lindner asks whether you could talk more about what the EU is doing to reduce push factors on the African continent and the Middle East. Uh, say many, many argue that EU should be doing more to reduce terrible conditions causing people to leave. Um, I think this is a key question. So in, um, I wouldn't say we've tried to use this crisis, but perhaps we have in a way and others to try to get Europe to address the reasons for displacement so when we talk about our alternatives to the externalization strategy, um, and actually, if I may, I'll just share our slide on that so you can see um, also the answer to your, your question there in a sense. Um, um, one of the alternatives we put forward is to have foreign policy that focuses at point four on the slide that you can see, causes of forced displacement, war, repression, corruption, poverty, insecurity, all of the reasons why people are leaving. And as you say um, in your question there, the push factors, um, the, 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 these are the other alternatives that we promote, making asylum work in Europe, safe and legal routes, resettlement, sponsorship, um, uh, student scholarships for refugees, ways to arrive legally, and also inclusion in Europe. Um, but the foreign policy piece is crucial to try to tackle push factors. There's a certain amount of traction in those arguments. Um, uh, so with countries, and I would say particularly Germany, um, investing more, for instance, in Africa. I mean, Germany never had any particular interest in Africa as part of its foreign policy um, and in the last five years that's massively increased so I'm anytime I go to Africa um, in a normal year I would probably be two or three times in different African countries you see this increased German presence very significantly and it's to do with migration in a way um, and so there are attempts to use Europe's uh, external policies to actually prevent displacement. Unfortunately, at the same time, you see Europe's external policies being used to try to prevent movement. So rather than development policy being used to meet the sustainable development goals, it becomes more and more likely that it's used to fund a government to strengthen its borders. Um, or to put in place a, a strategy of migration uh, control, or even in the worst cases, we see conditionality on development assistance or on other cooperation saying that, that uh, funds cooperation won't be offered unless a country accepts back and readmits its own citizens. Um, those are all things that undermine and create more displacement. Um, and I would see, say also one of the the impact on the rest of the world um, that I mentioned, the, doing deals with repressive regimes. So there's the Turkey situation, which is, is a, a very complex relationship. Um, there are attempts to do similar deals with other countries. They never work, but they do provide support to repressive leaders. So for instance, a cooperation with Sudan before uh, the, the recent change of government and mini revolution in Sudan, where um, European countries were offering support and propping up to some extent the repressive Sudanese regime in order that they take back the Sudanese people who were in Europe. Um, and the, this government here, Belgium, was recently uh, slapped down by the European courts for cooperating with the Bashir Sudanese regime 
inviting them to Belgium and essentially allowing them to pick Sudanese people who would be deported. Um, so there's potential there, but unfortunately, um, things go in both directions. I, I, I think conflict and security is the key piece as well. Investing in conflict prevention, it should be happening now because this would stop, uh, help a, a reduce displacement. Um, but you then have a disconnect with Europe still fueling conflict through arms sales, for instance. Thank you. Uh, we can move to Amanda Watlickner's question. Jess, what about climate change as a push factor, particularly in Africa? Yes, um, th this is the, the key question for the future, I think. So one of the comments I made at the end was that refugee law needs to be reformed and updated. And that is necessary, but probably impossible. And um, the main reason it's necessary is climate change. Um, I mean, you could add other reasons, but there are new causes of displacement. And the Refugee Convention is a document that's 60 years old, um, of course, doesn't cover contemporary displacement. Um, it's still focused on persecution as a cause of displacement. And then since then, through UNHCR's work, conflict, most situations of conflict will be grounds for protection. But people fleeing and displaced due to climate change, um, in most cases, won't get protection. Of course, in parts of the Americas, they might. That's a, a different question. Um, so we would argue, ideally, international refugee law should be reformed, you know, a, a, an amendment to the convention a protocol on the convention that covers climate displacement. But it's too risky because if it, the international legal framework opens up, um, countries will use that to reduce protection standards rather than expanding to deal with climate change. Um, I think climate change is an area where Europe is investing a lot in prevention, mitigation and adaptation. So, um, unlike questions of conflict and security and governance, where unfortunately Europe is doing very little, it is trying and leading the way on climate change. Um, nonetheless, I, I think if we look at push factors from Africa, this idea that we hear so often that you can separate the deserving refugee and the undeserving migrant, this very quickly falls apart because most people who are forced to leave African countries, there's multiple reasons for that. And their status may change on the route even. So they may be forced to displace, uh, forced to leave because their livelihood has been destroyed by climate change. Um, but then after having left, they may then be subject to torture in Libya. Um, th their situation in their country of origin may change and they would then be at risk if they were sent back. So I think this uh, simplistic approach of using the law to separate the deserving and the undeserving is very challenging because of environmental and other factors. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next question. The, the writer says, uh, I suppose there are two questions. One, uh, appreciating the effect, the effort to focus on issues the EU is facing, such as COVID. But what about recent work that shows how COVID is used to support externalization policies and racist discourses, such as asylum seekers as diseased? What would be some strategies to deal with this? And then just the, the same questioner writes another one other question. How do you see coloniality as manifest in the structural problems that the Middle East and Africa are facing? and also in the way the EU views these regions and displaced people. Yeah, um, uh, thank you to the, the um, questioner there, Pervin. And uh, again, crucial issues. On COVID, it's been a mixed picture. Um, the impact on displaced people in Europe has been largely negative, but with a few surprising and unpredictable concrete positive changes. So the negative effects are the ones that you're hinting at in your question. Borders have been closed. So again, refugees around Europe have not been able to arrive and seek protection. 
Um, that's despite the fact that the European Commission, UNHCR and UNHCR very clearly stated that there should be an exemption to border closures for those seeking protection, even during a health emergency. So there's no excuse for doing that. We also saw countries try to use COVID um, to put in place even more restrictive uh, uh, regimes and policies. The Greek government tried to use COVID to basically shut down its asylum system, um, and this was also uh, short-lived, luckily. Um, we also see, uh, I think the most significant impact is going to be in the quality of asylum procedures, where there's a shift to online and this answers, I think, the internet uh, question as well. Online asylum processes, so the interview, for instance, might take place online due to COVID. Um, but countries are trying to generalize some of those methods. Um, and this then leads us to the ultimate goal of externalization, which is that asylum procedures themselves take place outside Europe. Um, and th this would be in a center, for instance, uh, Tunisia or Egypt or, or somewhere where European asylum processes take place extraterritorially, um, which takes us to something closer to the Australian model. Um, uh, we, we still have politicians in Europe who praise, extol the, the Australian model. Um, and so there's been an experiment during the COVID time of some of these methods and an argument made, well, if we're doing a remote interview with somebody who's in an internet cafe in Athens, we could equally do a remote interview with somebody in Tunisia. Um, the, the, the real obstacle to all of that is that no other countries want to host detention centers for people trying to seek asylum in Europe however much money is thrown at them. Um, and this model of paying for containing people for various reasons only really works with Turkey. Of course, it, for us, it doesn't work, but for those who consider it a success. Um, on the other hand, there are one or two positive results of COVID. One has been an easing of detention regimes in Europe. So many people, uh, the, the many countries in Europe use detention, in our view, illegally uh, for asylum seekers and for people who have negative asylum decisions. Um, and during the COVID period, some of that detention, uh, use of detention was reduced. Um, and notably, for instance, in the UK, which is a, a, a ma manages a model of detention and deportation, but had to, to release people during COVID. And these are people who shouldn't be detained in the first place. Um, then there's been a small expansion in the right to work. And this comes also from um, the sense of recognizing the value of asylum seekers and refugees in Europe and the skills that they have. So you have high profile cases like Syrian doctors who were fast tracked to get the right to work during the crisis, but you also have a wider expansion of the right to work. So here in Belgium, for instance, wider categories of asylum seekers were given the right to work during this crisis. So there are some small differences and the fact that the issue is not number one on the political agenda is always positive because when it is, number one topic, bad things happen. Um, and the colonial issue is also key. I mean, there's a very strong um, colonial legacy in the treatment of this issue by Europe um, in, in many different ways. Um, the attitude towards people arriving, the sense that they're either exploiting or victims or other in one or other way, and the racism uh, that, that, that shapes attitudes towards refugees and, and other vulnerable migrants arriving, um, you know, as part of our, our colonial heritage in Europe. You also see a sort of neo-colonialism in this attempt to get other countries to deal with the issue. Um, there's a sense that we will offer a bit of money to an African country and they're so poor and so weak that then they'll do anything uh, in order to get this money. And it, 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 it's often promoted by interior affairs ministers 
um, people working on law enforcement and border policy who have no experience of international relations or diplomacy or the reality um, of, of, of African politics and situation in different countries and the fact that there'll be just as much pressure from the population in a democratically elected on the democratically elected government in an African country saying don't uh, take this deal um, so so those this part one of the reasons why these things don't work because there's a naive a uh, neo-colonial attitude. Um, I, I would say in particular, there's also an intersection between race and sex. And the fact that on, in certain of the arrivals of people there have been more uh, males um, and particularly black males. So for instance, arriving in Italy, young African men, um, Th th those people have been reduced to uh, a very reductionist approach treats them as a threat um, and so for instance the vulnerability of young male uh, migrants and refugees is often completely disregarded despite um, the extreme violations and violence that people face, particularly if they cross Libya. Um, and that's also, again, embedded in, I think, racist and colonial background. I think we've got time for one final question. And so um, I'll, I'll put to you the question from Stephanie Shady. Um, you mentioned religious organizations and NGOs filling in gaps in humanitarian assistance that states have left open. What are some ways that these organizations are doing advocacy work for legal changes in addition to their programmatic operations? And have you observed any instances of progress in this area? Um, that's also a very good question that takes us to the heart of our work as well. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're engaged in litigation. We try to use the courts, as do many of our members, because at a time when the political environment is quite hostile, you rely on the courts to defend people's rights. Um, but we've still tried to do advocacy and political advocacy um, here at the EU level and in many European countries, some of that work is quite defensive. Um, so we propose our alternatives as well, because we have an obligation to do so. And you can't just criticize. You also have to say, what is your alternative vision? So if you criticize the EU Turkey deal, you always have to be ready to say, there was an alternative, there should have been a temporary protection regime, there should have been the deployment of an emergency operation. You know, you have to have your alternatives. And even now, we, we spent um, about a year promoting our alternatives to uh, for the European Pact on Migration and Asylum that was published in September 2020. We all knew it was coming. So we put forward our alternatives and advocated for them. And this was the vision of Europe based on making asylum systems function, expanding safe and legal routes for people to arrive at protection so they don't have to take terrible journeys. And so you don't have this fear-induced sea arrival situation um, and then inclusion through rights, respect, regularization for people in Europe and the foreign policy piece. So this alternative vision, um, I would say, unfortunately, we had very little impact um, because the pact when it was produced continued the externalization approach. Um, in the different ways that were mentioned, external borders and internal policies. Um, nonetheless, we argue, and I think it's the case also at national level in many cases, if there wasn't this advocacy going on, things would be much, much worse. So in 2016, one of the responses was a package of legislative reforms that basically would have codified the EU-Turkey deal model. Um, anybody, any refugee arriving in Europe um, would have been, could have been sent to a so-called safe third country. This was the idea. And the idea was to put this onto, into EU law, codified. Um, we and others did a lot of advocacy um, political yes but legal advocacy to influence the legal framework and trying to prevent those proposals going through and they didn't go through 
Um, so sometimes we're talking about that. This is kind of where we are now with the new pact, where there's a set of legislative proposals that accompany the pact and that are not as bad as 2016, but still bad. Um, and we're now engaged in more defensive work to try to get the European Parliament, one of the co-legislators, to amend those proposals and mitigate the damage. So it's partly that. And then another element I, I would add in terms of advocacy is this focus on compliance. So I, I think some of the other questions referred to this, there's great variety in Europe because member states are not implementing the law. Um, so somebody seeking protection may have an Afghan arriving in Europe has a 3% chance of getting protection in some countries and a 98% chance of getting protection in other countries, the same person, um, no objective difference in the case. And that's because asylum systems are not functioning, there's political intrusion, there's poor quality decision making, appeals have been removed. So there's a lot of advocacy that focuses on compliance um, with standards, changing practice. Um, progress, it, it, it's difficult. I think there we would say that the situation would be much worse without these efforts. And it remains the case that there is polarization and division on these issues. And there are political leaders, parties, uh, local governments, also business communities, as well as NGOs and ordinary people not all, 50-50, depends on the country, but who are on the side of trying to ensure that protection in Europe remains. Well, please uh, join me, all of you, in, in thanking uh, Catherine Willard for um, a really fascinating, um, difficult and concerning talk, uh, but also a talk um, that I think uh, is, is particularly valuable at this uh, at this moment in history. Uh, we really appreciate your joining us uh, for the talk. Thank you again to the Center for European Studies, uh, as well as to the Reckford family. Um, and uh, uh, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and also for your excellent questions and comments. Good night. Good night, all.